Gumbe, Idia. In northern Ghana, where life flows as gently as the river waves, there is a tune of hope. Tamale, located in Ghana's northern region, is a city known for its persistence. However, one of its towns located in the Nanton district hides a secret. The educational system here faces great challenges, particularly for its young girls. At 10 a.m. on a Wednesday, the scorching sun in Gono is merciless. I mean, absolutely unbearable. I encountered a group of young girls on their way to school, barefoot and unaccompanied. Their vulnerable state stared both concern and curiosity within me. Why were they walking under the scorching sun, devoid of shoes and supervision? The ground was scorching hot, forcing them to either hasten their pace towards the shade of a tree to cool off or to hop on their feet while walking. Some even cried due to the unbearable heat. Wumbe, a mere four years old and in primary one at Gno MA Primary School, faces the challenge of attending classes while also looking after her younger siblings. She must balance her studies with caring for them while at school. Her little brother is only nine months old and her sister is two years old. Their mother frequently leaves them under Wumbe's care while she tends to her duties on the farm. In this village, respect for the elderly is paramount. So, saying no is not an option for Wumbe. Wumbe, I'm a bear. I'm a bear. Bukum Nenda. Abole Bala. Ntofabla. Wumbe, Idia. Tobachi. Azbazaz Yibedi. She silently battles the consequences due to the heavy weight of Wumbe's brother. Radia, Wumbe's slightly stronger friend, helps carry the younger brother as they make their way to school. Radia, Bozaka Sondo. Wumbe could talk back to the son Chakai, Baba Woma. Leaving children under the supervision of their older siblings in Guno is a long lasting tradition in this community, one that is increasingly becoming accepted as the standard practice in schools. Mariam Adam arrives at school with her little brother on her back and her sister walking beside her. Although she is the only one officially enrolled in the school, her siblings must accompany her because their parents are heading to the farm. As classes were about to begin, the reality became evident. The classrooms were predominantly filled with pairs of seniors and junior siblings. As soon as lessons began, Wumbe found herself constantly distracted by her brother and sister. Maintaining focus for even a minute proved to be a challenge throughout the entire class session. Mariam 
was also not spared from the distractions. Her younger brother, who initially seemed to be enjoying the class lessons, suddenly became restless. The teacher always had to intervene when they began crying uncontrollably, soothing them until they calmed down. The teachers here are growing increasingly frustrated with the parents' actions within the community. This community is a farming community. So it's very rampant to see uh, parents giving their, their, uh, their kids to their siblings to bring to school uh, due to the nature of their works at home. When they are to go to farm, they bring their, they give them to their, uh, their younger siblings to cater for. So like, it's very rampant. When you come to class, you have to control them in addition with their siblings. So most of the times they interrupt the lessons. It's worrying because you can be explaining something to their understanding and due to a, a younger sibling crying, you have to pause and go and console that person. So that way it makes them know to understand almost let me just say mostly what you are teaching for the lesson. So it makes you to be going front and back, which makes understanding, teaching and learning very difficult. Some of them, they come to the classroom without eating or without taking their breakfast. So during your teaching time, they will be leaving the classroom frequently. During break time, Wumbe appeared tired and overwhelmed. In the midst of our conversation, her brother continued crying incessantly, likely due to hunger as they had not eaten since morning. With a polite demeanor, Wumbe asked a friend to fill a bottle with water from a nearby stream which the community relies on. The quality of the water will be a topic for another day's discussion. Mariam expressed her concern, stating that she lost concentration in class when her brother began crying, highlighting the impact of such disruptions on her education. I lost concentration in the classroom when my brother started crying during lessons. It's worrying. Imagine being just four years old and responsible for the care of your younger siblings while your parents are away at the farm. This is the harsh reality for many children in Guno community in the northern region where attending school means bringing their siblings along or sacrificing their education altogether. Teachers have voiced their concerns, yet the situation persists, jeopardizing the educational future of these young ones. This is worrying. Every child has the right to receive a proper education without compromising their responsibilities at home. But here in the Guno MA school, the situation is different. It's okay. <laughs> the head teacher of Gno MA Primary School, Adam Mohamed Awal, explains that sending the younger children home often leads parents to retrieve the older siblings as well. Despite this, they prioritize the children's education and allow the arrangement, hoping for improvement in the future. Those children are supposed to be with their mothers. But they usually don't, uh, the mothers usually don't uh, take them, but rather they give them to their brothers to take them to school. With the reason that they are going to farm, they are going to fetch water, they are going to cook, a lot of uh, uh, excuses. So when they bring them to school, we usually don't want to sack them because once we tell the child to send the, uh, uh, the younger brother home, 
that is all. The child will never return back to school. So we just don't want to deny them the opportunity of being in school. So sometimes we allow some of them who are at least uh, three years or even two and a half years to sit. Once they will not, be, uh, they will, they will not disturb their brothers or one day will not cry. Almost every day, you will see at least five, six, seven children coming to school with their younger brothers. So it's rampant. These girls are expected to juggle the demands of education with familial responsibilities, often becoming caretakers of their younger siblings and sacrificing their own educational opportunities. Sadly, this situation is not unique to Guno. It is a widespread issue affecting many communities in northern Ghana. I had to wait until school was over to meet with parents of these innocent children enduring such hardships. Upon arrival, Wumbe's mother, Baraka Samed, was receptive and promised to take responsibility of the younger ones henceforth. <laughs> I'm aware that he goes to the school, but I will ensure that he doesn't go with Wumbe to distract her in class. Mariam's mother also made the same promise to take responsibility of her younger children from now on. I leave the child at home and head to the farm because it's not far from home. However, the child sometimes makes his way to Mariam's school. I will make sure to advise my fellow women not to leave their children in the care of their siblings while they are at school. The chief of Gno. Fuseni Al Hassan is aware of this issue and acknowledges that it worsens during the farming season. Parents rely heavily on their children's help on the farms during this time, resulting in many children being unable to attend school. <laughs> Some of the children are wayward. There are instances when teachers arrive in the classroom only to find empty desks. I have even witnessed some teachers attempting to teach, but some pupils ignore their presence and leave for their homes. During the farming seasons, many children do not go to school early, as some parents also burden them with household chores. I am aware that some children go to school with their younger siblings in their care, but that is not right. Now that you've brought this to my attention, I will ensure it is not done. If it's something that continues for a long time, it affects the learning outcome of these uh, uh, young, uh, the young ones, especially uh, the girl child. And in a situation where you are looking at the right of children, you are looking at the capacity of a child to be able to provide care for another child. So if they are not in a position to do that, then they, that, that can also lead to abuse of, of, of the child. And the teacher who is in the classroom, who cannot even command some of these things to stop, would, would also find him or herself in a situation where we compromise on any services that happen in the classroom, uh, which automatically means that you have abandoned the, the, the learning aspect of it. So it's, it's, it's something that affects young people because already when, when, the, when there is a younger child at home, the possibility of the, the girls are dropping from school is very, very high. And some of these activities, if it continues, what happens is that the girl child will be forced to drop out of the classroom. The District Director of Education, Mohamed Mumuni Adams, expressed concern that this situation could discourage the children from attending school. If a child is not up to four years, he has nothing to do in the school because we do not run nursery. Uh -huh. We are running cages and therefore the cage, the child must be four years and above to be able to be admitted. 
There are times teachers come to complain that you are in the classroom with an older child. A parent walks in, tells you that oh, I'm bringing you this younger child, let him be in the classroom so I will take the older one to the, the farm. And these are all issues we are still grappling with. It's not a normal practice we encourage. You are even putting the child's life uh, in jeopardy. Because uh, at this stage, they pick a lot of uh, uh, diseases. Uh, yes, when the child is so young and is allowed to come and mingle with other things, the likelihood that the child will pick some infections is very high. Once you are a child in primary school, and you are giving care to a younger one in that same environment, obviously you are distracted. Don't forget that even without the distraction, these environments are already challenging in the most prior parts of the country. And so having the distraction, you know, uh, virtually wraps, you know, um, sorts through one's injury. And so, yes, they will be distracted. They cannot concentrate on the lesson and they may complete a full cycle of um, le lesson without any lesson. You understand? That is, for me, the, the critical issue. And if you don't manage these things carefully, you create a situation where within the same classroom, within the same deprived community, deprived school, you will still have inequalities, you know, being perpetrated by an unequal um, access to instruction within the classroom regime. And that is what we are not supposed to promote. Let's always see education as that instrument supposed to level and create I mean, fill up for the imbalances in our society. In Dimabi, situated in the Talon district of the northern region, education is in a state of paralysis as some parents are preventing their children from attending school. <laughs> Abdullah Ibrahim just woke up, ready to face the day's hassle. He washes his face and prepares to milk the cattle, accompanied by his junior brother, who is gradually learning from him. Afterward, he guides the cattle deep into the bush to graze. I get ready in the morning and search for food to eat before setting off to the bush with the cattle. He does not enjoy it. His true desire is to be in a classroom learning. Yet, he feels obligated to obey his father's wishes and continue tending to the cattle. His father, Abdullah Tido, believes that it was the best decision he made to have his son take care of the cattle instead of going to school. <laughs> I believe it's the best decision to have my son take care of the cattle. He is my son and I have chosen to entrust him with the responsibility. I understand the benefits of education, but this tradition is important to me. My own father raised me in the same manner and I'm passing it on to my sons. I want Ibrahim's younger brother to grow up enough to be able to care for the cattle before Ibrahim can go to school. Ibrahim's older brother used to do the same, but he became frustrated and ran away. I can't say when he will go to school till his younger brother is strong enough to handle the cattle. Having walked for about eight hours with the cattle, it's now time for them to quench their thirst. With his friends, they guide the cattle to the dam, where they share the water with the animals. Ibrahim's friend, Hafiz Abdullah, was attending school and had reached primary one. Shockingly, his grandfather had to let him quit so 
he could take care of the family's cattle. My grandfather made me stop school. Until now, I'm not happy about it. I would love to be a doctor, but my grandfather's instructions won't allow me. I wish to be in school, but I can't disrespect his wish. It was then that Hafiz realized his dream of becoming a doctor was shattering right before his eyes. Parents would not allow their kids to be in school. Hafiz Ibrahim would have to follow cattle into the bush here and because of that their dreams are gradually washing away. They wish to be in the classrooms but immediately they wake up every morning the only thought that comes into their mind is how they will be able to follow their cattle into the bush for them to be able to feed and grow properly. For him, for instance, he has had a conversation with his grandfather to be able to allow him into the classroom. But that will definitely not happen. It means their dreams will be put to hold. It's purely a concept of child labor, uh, despite the fact that people have practiced it for a while. We now have a law that protects the interests of children and there are some activities that we've listed that children can do and the activities that they cannot do, especially where uh, it can, the activity that the child is involved in can be economically gainful to another person without necessarily the child, or activity that takes the child away from the classroom, or activity that will have impact on the health of the child. So if you put all these together, you realize that following uh, the cattle and taking care of them as a child do have a lot of health implications and then the right of education is undermined. And even where people are making money out of it without necessarily uh, aiding the child's development, then clearly it's activity that we can describe as exploitative, it's activity that could also affect the child. So we have to look at some of these in a broader context and then begin to look at how we can develop specific interventions to target certain areas of this country and the law has also prescribed some form of punishment for those who do that, especially when it is not the right, the right of the child to education or it abuses the health and the, or causes harm to the child. The stories continually highlights the neglectful behavior of parents in these communities and emphasize the critical role education plays in shaping children's futures. There are some communities that are there and the children are there, they are not going to school. So it is not a surprise at all. We are not shifting the problem to the parents at all. We are rather trying our part and asking the parents to also try their part so that it, we come together and meet at a particular point. Because it is not uh, the work of one person. If the parent says, okay, go to school and the children are not going to school, it, it is left with GES, it is led with the district assembly, it is led with every uh, stakeholder to come together and then bring about positive mindset about education. In Kasaugu, located in the Sagnarugu municipality, Abdul Rahman Al Hassan, age 16, had to drop out of school to become a mechanic as a senior apprentice. All the younger ones learn from him. Being able to repair a faulty motorbike and get it running again is a significant achievement for them, symbolizing a brighter future ahead. I was attending school at first, but one day, my parents asked me to do some work at home before I headed to school. As a result, I arrived late, which upset my teachers and led to a misunderstanding with some of them. I told my parents I wouldn't go to school again, and they agreed. Abdul Majid Bassett, age 12, however, attends school and then comes here to work after school hours. My parents enrolled me here. I combined school with mechanic work. I want to learn and acquire skills. And I dream of owning a shop where I can employ more people one day. Moses Mahama is their boss. 
I enroll them because I want them to be their own bosses in the future, so that they can solely care for their family one day. The kids are smart, they learn very fast. Some of them have been under my care for two years now. I know the importance of education, which is to be able to write and speak well. I advise them to go to school if they can. In Ghana, 80% of school-age children are enrolled in primary school. However, this still leaves up to 1 million children between the ages of 6 and 14 recorded as out of school. Some children in the northern part of Ghana are out of school and working in jobs that are often strenuous and dangerous. Statistics from the 2021 Population and Housing Census conducted by the Ghana Statistical School Service have revealed that 1,215,546 children of school-going age, which is 4 to 17 years, are being denied their rights to learn and grow. And out of the over 1.2 million children not going to school, 942,427 children have never attended school at all. Statistics from the Ghana School Service report indicated that the Savannah region has 43.2% of children who have never attended school, which is the highest percentage in the country. These findings are contained in the 2021 Population and Housing Census thematic brief on childhood vulnerabilities in Ghana, which presents statistics on children in Ghana, focusing on the number of distribution of vulnerable children and the correlates of child vulnerabilities. The northern part of Ghana has consistently been at the forefront of discussions regarding gaps in the education sector. There is a pressing need to do much more to raise awareness among people in that region about the importance of education. Our constitution frowns on parents refusing to take their children to school. Our laws, including the Children's Act, that's 560, frowns on parents not enrolling their children in school, especially when they are involving them in household chores or economic activity. It, it amounts to an infringement on the rights of the child and it, it squarely falls within the ambit of the law that simply says that in every decision the best interest of the child should be considered. If parents take such decisions, I ask, was the best interest of the child considered? Obviously not. And so taking your child to farm when there is ready access to a school, there's a school in the environment, obviously our laws runs on them. The challenge is that our local assemblies have not been forthcoming, you know, with exacting sanctions prescribed by, by the Children's Act to such parents. There are provisions that ensure that child partners are supposed to be set up and parents who flood these regulations are sanctioned according to law. And so I will continue to encourage these assemblies to ensure that the laws that that you know, um, mandates parents from enrolling their children in school when there is, when there is or where there are schools um, to be implemented you know, to the latter. Sustainable Development Goal 4 emphasizes the importance of quality education. The goal aims to ensure that all girls and boys complete free primary and secondary schooling by 2030 provide equal access to affordable vocational training, eliminate gender and wealth disparities, and achieve universal access to quality higher education. However, in many deprived areas of the northern region, young boys and girls are already engaged in menial jobs instead of attending school. This trend is alarming and highlights the urgent need for intervention to ensure that every child has access to education as outlined in Sustainable Development Goal 4. Godwin Asidiba, TV3, Tamale.